our boys here bought in a billion pounds worth of equipment, which I'll keep afterwards. Uh, so we are streaming to people outside. Hello to anyone outside watching us at the moment. And with that, I'll hand over to Graham. Thank you, Adam. And we really appreciate use of this facility. Adam's driven all the way from Seven Oaks today yeah. to make sure that it all works perfectly. When he, got here, at, said, oh. when he got here at seven o'clock this morning, the door would not open. <laughs> <laughs> so, so we've had the maintenance man in to sort the door out. So we really appreciate uh, what you've done, Adam. Thank you very much. Welcome everybody. Uh, for those that don't know, I'm Graham Murchie, G4FSG. Um, I think I'm president of Marshallsham Radio Society, so um, that's one of my roles. This is the 40th version of the uh, Marshallsham Roundtable. Um, I can't remember exactly what the nth is because we seem to have missed a couple with COVID, but um, there we are. And we're all deeply, deeply upset by the fact that the RSGB awarded a, made an award to the GM roundtable yesterday. Uh, and of course, they've only been running for 10 years. Mere youngsters, mere youngsters. But no, seriously, great that they, they got the award for promoting VHF and microwaves in Scotland. So that, that's great. Um, Adam's mentioned we are streaming. Uh, in theory, we're streaming on Zoom. I don't know whether that's happening yet. Zoom's not happening yet, but we're on the BATC yep. site. So, BATC, welcome to everyone who is uh, remote, in particular Paul AQA. Hope you're recovering. Um, I've removed your badges from the list, so okay. Um, test gear in the central room, where it was last year, um, all sorts of uh, gear for measurement. Um, so what else? Refreshments available, as Adam said. Please um, purchase what you can. All the profits this year will go to the local hospice who are at this very moment in desperate needs of funds. So um, that's where the profits will go. Sandwiches and cakes, etc. Uh, phones to silent, please, if you wouldn't mind, so that we don't interrupt the, uh, the speakers. I think that's most of what I need to cover. But before we start, uh, Peter, G3LTF, uh, is going to say a couple of words. Thank you, Colin. Can I use the lecture? Just to support more than anything else. <laughs> <laughs> In case I need it. Well, good morning, everybody. And Graham, thank you for, uh, for, for um, giving me the introduction to this. So this is about Simon. Simon... G3LQR passed away peacefully on March the 28th at the age of 88. He was one of the best known micro and UHF call signs on both sides of the North Sea. And Simon was a pioneer in many fields of microwave radio and inspired many others to follow his lead. He had 30 firsts on the bands above 70 centimetres and 2009 was awarded the G3WZ trophy here. When I first knew him, which was 1958-59, he was G6LQR stroke T, transmitting studio TV on 70 centimetres. He then passed his CW test and became G3LQR. And by about 1975, it's hard to work out exactly when, but somewhere around there, he was operating on all the microwave bands up to 10 <coughs> gigahertz. Later on, he added 24 and 47 gigahertz. His favourite band for DX working was 70 centimetres, and he made some amazing tropo contacts into the old Soviet Union up to 2,000 kilometres. I don't think anyone surpassed that over, over land in, in Europe. He started on EME in, on 432 megs in March 1975, building a 20 foot dish from Dexin Angle and Chicken Wire, which was sadly destroyed in the 1987 hurricane. So for 70 centimetres, he built a succession of large Yagi arrays, all homebrew, of course, from DL6WU and K2RIW designs. <coughs> in March 1992, he put up a 14-foot dish and started on 23 centimetre EME with 100 watts from a single 7289. He then progressed up the bands, 13 centimetres, and finally to 9 and 6, the limits for that dish. There have been many tributes to him from the worldwide EME community. His radio interests, which are wide, 
also included three centimetre rain scatter, 70 centimetre aurora, and in both of those he was an early pioneer. Plus, of course, four metre ES working and 28 megs F2. He was a serious and dedicated home brewer of his equipment, often modified for something you found at a scrapyard or a rally, and was very good at getting the stuff to actually work. Sometimes, though, the enclosures were not that extensive. <laughs> and so it was safest to keep your hands in your pockets when in his show. Simon was a kind, generous and gentle man. He loved nature and was a great photographer in his later years of the butterflies on the farm where he lived. So rest in peace, our old friend. Simon was quite keen, I know, um, that, that um, we should try and find a home for some of his stuff. And, and particularly, if anybody feels they have um, uh, can make use of the dish, just can you contact me um, by email g3ltf at btinternet.com um, and, um, and we can talk about um, how that could be done. But it's, it's, it's a good dish, 14 foot mesh and um, it, it worked very well up to nine centimetres and also actually on, on six as well. Graham, thank you. Thank, thank you, Peter. It was an experience visiting Simon's shack, I can assure you. <laughs> Peter is absolutely right. You definitely kept your hands in your pockets, but uh, there we are. Okay, well, let's um, move on to the, um, the first talk, which is a double header, so to speak, with um, Roger and Noel. Roger, of course, is the uh, the editor of uh, Scatterpoint, so many of you will know him from that perspective, but he's always pushing the frontiers of the, uh, the millimetre band. So, Roger, uh, please come and tell us the latest in the saga. We're going to split this up. I'm going to talk about the uh, technical side. Um, but it's really the technical side from my point of view, my journey through uh, Millimeter. Um, Noel's going to be talked about some of the uh, operating that he's done and some of the more recent operating we've done together on 122 mainly. Might get to 134, yeah, I think, possibly. That'd be good. A lot of people ask me why we sort of do Millimeter. You know, it's a good question. It's a challenge. And I think somebody said, you know, it's difficult, but that's, that's what it's all about. And also, I was asked how many QSOs you make per hour. <laughs> 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 hours, hours per QSO. Per day. <laughs> <laughs> the higher band. So I didn't know quite where I was going to go with this, but I decided that there's a lot of gear now around for um, 24 gigs. Um, certainly on some of the contests last year, we're getting up to sort of uh, double figures for the number of contacts. So I was decided to, to start this at 47 um, and go up to there. Um, might get to 241. I've always thought that I might get to 241 one day. But mainly mainly the uh, 47 up to 134. Um, yeah, so like I said, this has to be some of my journey, how I got there in the past, how what I'm doing now, and what, what's available. So, so for 47 gigs, the HUNA DB6NT transverter. So that's a great start. I'll talk about that a bit more in a, in a minute. Um, Homebrew, the WR28 mix, mixers, which there used to be quite a few on eBay, they're still around. They, they do work at, although they expect 26 to 40, to 40, they work at 47 gigs. And, that, and that's what I've used. And we need to get the um, a local oscillator and uh, Passalink. There were a lot of Passalink systems around the actual multiplier out of those 
times four multiplier gives you certainly sort of 10 or 15 milliwatts out. Um, I think uh, if you hit it harder, it will give a bit more. It's used on the um, uh, on some of the beacons. Even better would be to use a sort of I mean, it's what the DB6NT did on the previous um, system to use a, a subharmonic mixer with a hello at a half frequency. Um, there, are, there are preamps available from still from Huna, but more recently the developed from development from uh, Eban and uh, his group have made an incredibly low noise. Um, sorry, can I just, sorry to just pause you. Can we? Um just so we can get so some people here might have not quite perfect hearing, right. like myself, right. listen to laps and out music as a young person. Uh, so we can use this, and then it will help also okay. uh, external. So let uh, me just get this on. And one Test one, two, three. Is that uh, will that be better for people? Okay, yeah. here we go. So okay, so right. We're, we're with the microphone. So good. I, I know I haven't got a very loud voice. That's probably yeah, probably good. Okay, so just. Just gone through the possibilities um, on the on the preamp. Um, Eban has just very recently received, I think, what was it? Was it Jupiter or Saturn? The noise from the certainly one of the nearby um, planets, which is on 47 gigs, using his uh, uh, preamp, which is uh, exceptional. Um, Paramps, paramps, yeah, that's another story. Get that together in a minute. Okay, th this is the uh, DB6NT uh, Huma <coughs> transverter. That that is currently still available. Um, it's not cheap, but it's um, <laughs> it, it, it works extremely well. It uses the image rejection mixing. Um, but the, the transverter is not the whole story. You you need to have a uh, local oscillator and a waveguide switch to go with it, as on the right. Uh, and ideally, one of their nice power amplifiers, which certainly will do half a watt. I don't think I haven't seen the one that would give one watt out yet, but uh, half a watt is a lot of power at uh, 47 gigs. Unfortunately, um, they're not making any more. They've got the capability, and they may do in the future, but uh, certainly at the moment they're not making any. So I'll, I'll sort of move on to sort of my story, how I got to 47 gigs. And this was in Scatterpoint quite a while ago. I, I needed to do something in a hurry. So what I used was a, a WR28 mixer. This had a IF amplifier attached to it as it, as it came, so that's, I used that. Um, and I had a w, WR28 waveguide switch, which again, <coughs> would work at uh, 47. And the uh, pass link multiplier, which I just talked about. So what I did there was to uh, use the, the, the output of the passing multiplier, about, about sort of 10 milliwatts or so, I think a little bit less, I wasn't driving hard enough then. I had a bit of flexi waveguide around my switch, so I could switch the multiplier out to, to be LO on the mixer, and I could also switch it directly out. Of course that would allow CW, my <coughs> CW capabilities are not great. Um, so what I did there is to use a, and I was using an Elcom synthesizer, so that was limited what IF I used, not that that mattered at the time, but I, I wanted to FM it, so my simple way of FMing it then was to replace the 10 meg reference crystal with a 9.99 meg one, which, uh, which got me in the middle of the band, and uh, simply FM modulated the, uh, that crystal reference. I wouldn't necessarily advocate that solution, but it did work. This is the actual transverter. Um, it, oh, I've forgotten where the dishes came from. It might be in Peter. Anyway, the, 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 these dishes work well at 47 and, uh, and 76. Uh, it's an offset dish. So I've got the waveguide switch in the middle, uh, uh, a feed horn, um, and the uh, the passing multiplier on the right, and the sort of the synth and that's hidden behind the behind the dish. Um, yeah, it worked very well. That actual feed horn didn't fully illuminate the dish, so I made a very simple solution to that. I got a hacksaw and hacksaw the end off, <laughs> um, and it worked quite well after that. 
th this is now my evolution of it. So th th this is um, what I'm using now. So I've still got the WR28 mixer, <coughs> still got the Pasolink multiplier. I've got a, a, a 47 gig filter in front of the mixer. That came from uh, came, came from here a few years ago, the original on 50 gigs. But the difference now is I've added in a uh, preamplifier, which I recently changed to the, uh, the E-band one, which is the one sitting there. And I managed to pick up a wideband amplifier. So the technique I've used here is I've put the preamplifier and the power amplifier in series. And I simply use a waveguide switch to switch them between transmit and receive. There are a few dangers there because a power amplifier will put out 50 milliwatts. And if something spikes it on receive, I'll put 50 milliwatts in the mixer and that'll probably be the end of it. I've replaced a few diodes, but not from doing that, from actually uh, overdriving it. It, it works very well. What I've added to there, are, which you put, if you look carefully, at the top is an uh, IOGAL 24 gig transverter. Um, I'm going to change the pointer. Yeah, so that, that's the IOGAL transverter at the top, the uh, normal coax relay on there for 24 gigs. So the 24 gig feed horn is strapped underneath the, uh, the 47 gig one. And that gives me a, a, a dual band transverter. And I used that um, like on the last cumulative um, contest. Um, I intended to swap to my much better 24 system for some, some contacts, but I made all 10 of my 24 gig contacts just using this and then going to 47. And the big advantage there is you just have to change the elevation. So uh, that, that worked out very well. This is the um, sort of transfer to use. This is actually receiving the uh, the Bell Hill um, beacon on uh, on 24. But you see, I can just switch between uh, 24 and 47, and here's yeah, so it's simply that uh, elevation change. The, 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 the 24 gig form horn is a WR34 horn. It's just a couple of elastic bands, but it, it works. I, I said I'd go back to the 47 gig PA. Um, unfortunately, the Kuna one is not available. Um, people are looking at this, these North, uh, uh, look at Northrop Grumman uh, chips available. APN uh, 319 looks very useful. Um, there's certainly amateurs in Portugal and in Germany looking at it. Um, Two to three watts linear on 47, that would be uh, pretty amazing. Um, it is very inefficient. It, 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 it's dissipating nearly 50 watts to, to put out a couple of watts. So that, that you, you do, and the, the, the actual plot there was on the, um, I think it was the, A, it was the 318 that uh, um, a friend of mine in the States did, and he was only getting about sort of 10 dB again. He was getting the power, um, but he found he couldn't operate it for very long because it was getting too hot, even with a sort of a normal heat sink and fan. So that, that is an issue, low efficiency. But the potential is there for somebody to put this together. You have to do the wire bonding to uh, make a decent power amp. So move, move, move on to, uh, to 76. Again, there was a nice DB6MT. Uh, uh, transfer to available, which I'll talk about, but uh, no more. Th th this is sort of sort of where I started, not totally. Um, so the basic um, transfer is, is on the left. Um, on the right, there's a separate transmitter. This uses a uh, a gun injection locked. Um, so that was a development. This particular system, with these nice two sort of 77 gig um, horns, was actually when the start of uh, vehicle radar, this was a Mitsubishi uh, test system. And I actually went and did some measurements on it to check the, uh, the, the levels of Mitsubishi. And then I saw it on eBay. 
I knew what it was because it, uh, it, 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 it was two guns, the horn, and more probably the, the 76 gig mixer that uh, became part of my system. So, sort of more or less back to where I started, which is how, how to get on the 76. The, the advantage here is you can use, if, if the, if you use I think the boards were available, but you can build a sort of a, a subharmonic mixer. <coughs> that's using a sort of back-to-back -back, uh, diode. Um, and well, in, in this case, yeah, so yeah, so not jump for that. Yeah, so the back-to-back -back diode because you can we've got um, multiplier blocks that work at uh, thirty-eight gigs, and then they're times three. And do, doing. Um, Experiments with uh, with John G four E A T to start with, we just had wide band noise, and the, the difference it made changing from a single diode to a back to back diode was was incredible. So this particular layout is was determined by the Alcon well, synthesizer, so it had an odd IF, but uh, that wasn't a problem. Um, it, it, it fairly fairly straightforward. The so these are the multipliers, they're, they're still available on uh, eBay, I think it's the top one now. Some guy in the States has seemed to have got a, a box of a couple of hundred of them, and they've been selling, uh, they're, not, they're not cheap, I think about 40, $45 or something like that, but not, not ridiculous. The, ha the housing on the right is um, well, typical, um, developed by DL2AM, takes the sort of the boards that uh, uh, DB6NT you were doing. So you, you actually can bolt up the, the multiplier straight on the block um, and get the all sort of 76 gig out. Um, or, or get your 76 gig drive on the diode as, as, as a mixer. In this case we're using it as a conversion. Um, this is the PCB or was from one of Chris's slides, which is sort of an explanation. A simple little bit of track, but there's an awful lot going on on that bit of bit of track. So there's been a whole incredible development in terms of working out the lengths of the of the, the stub lengths, the lengths of the uh, lengths of the feed, and the decoupling and everything else. So I got I, I, I decided to try and bring with me anything I've got that I'm not using. So I, I've got a couple of uh, boards which will work on 76 on the stand uh, if somebody wants one. So my, my development then was to um, see what I could do to improve the basic system. So I managed to get hold of a, a, a waveguide switch which came from uh, came from here a few years ago, a WR15 switch and used the uh, a preamp which was developed by Tom WA one MBA. Um, now, quite a few years ago, but uh, you, you could buy them directly from him. They did a production run. I think, I think of a hundred or so. They work pretty well. Um, sort of six dB uh, noise figure or so. Uh, and on the other side, I've got a, a power amplifier, which was uh, uh, from the States. My approach to seventy six was sort of how am I going to get image rejection? I couldn't find a filter at the time. So I had the idea of doing something different, and this was to use a 10 gig IF. So as soon as I did that, it meant I could find a bit of uh, WR8, WR8, which I think was given to you by the hand, yeah, I think. Um, put it in there, so I immediately have got um, rejection of lo local oscillator and image by uh, by using the cutoff of the uh, WR8 waveguide. Okay, it's got some loss at uh, 76, but because it was after the uh, the LNA or before the PA, that uh, that didn't bother me. And that worked quite well. The to get the low cost later was uh, Alcom synth driving a, a broad own module. A, a few years ago, there were a lot of these broad own modules available, and I found that if you sort of added a resistor and biased the mixer in them, that you could um, get the uh, LO, which were, were so the oscillator, which was times three, times three in, you could get to, up to about sort of half a watt out. And then what I used is a, a doubler, um, and that was simply a WR28 mixer hammered at the, on the uh, RF input, and that would give uh, um, 
twice where you can see how I'm getting about a milliwatt out of a WR28 uh, mixer used as a doubler. And I managed to pick up uh, an Arcom amplifier, which would give me up to about plus 13 dBm to, uh, to drive the mixer. And that's sort of what I was using. The, the waveguide switch was sort of the wrong polarisation. But I got over that by mounting a horn one on top of the other. Um, the, the sort of funny angle of the, the broader module is because of the funny angle of the waveguide coming out to get the maximum of 78 gigs out of the, uh, at the WR28 mixer. And there's actually a bit of waveguide here with a, uh, a knob and I can turn it so it actually get the angle I want, the maximum output. Because it, it doesn't come straight out. There, there's always a, a, a point on the waveguide where it works better when you're using it out of the range. Well, that's the um, that's the Helcom. The the bigger one is I don't know you can see it, but I think I think it's the the uh, LNA on the bottom, the power amp at the top. So that my. This is what I've got now, which is just my sort of evolution of that. So I've still got the, uh, the same LNA, the same PA. I've moved to a uh, one of Wayne Knowles um, 14 gig uh, um, synthesizer with a silent key, unfortunately. Um, he produced a whole load of uh, synthesizers up to 13.6 gigs. The 10 meg reference is in the box. And I've got, it uses two, uh, two wave guide WR, I'm not sure, that, I can't remember now whether 12 or 15 switches. So I have to remember to, uh, to switch both of them. I, I have had it, I've added a sort of a, a bit that sticks out here that hits the micro, micro switch, which turns the PA on to make sure I don't get it totally wrong. Um, I've, I've swapped the broader now because the broader um, I had to sort of, was getting annoying because I had to sort of wind it up and watch the meter and it didn't always do quite what I thought. So these are the, uh, there were quite a lot of these around which are the gold blocks which were attached to those green flat horns that were used on a sort of system on top of lampposts. It doesn't give a lot out but it, I've, I've actually got to go to a 20 dB attenuator before I go into my amplifier to give me about uh, uh, six or seven milliwatts to drive the uh, to drive the mixer. You might notice this is funny angles. You might notice the waveguide here. None of that was intentional. It, it fell off the tripod. That was the result. Uh, and my thought is, I'm not going to try and bend this back because if I try and bend it back, it will snap or whatever. But it still works, so I left it alone. And, and, and that's where the uh, the ten gig transverter sits. This is sort of going back a bit to as it was, so that's a broad um, drive going out by current. I'm not sure why I bothered to do that in the end. But, um, and, and that's the WR28 mixer, and that's going into the, uh, the Arcom amplifier. And the one thing I've replaced now, I have replaced the WR8 with a, a filter. I sort of, it's a 76 to 82 gig filter. I thought, well, it, it was quite cheap on eBay, so I just swapped it over. I'm not sure it gives me any advantage, but maybe the high frequency cutoff is useful. Yeah, DB6NT transverter, very nice. You need the local oscillator with it. You need a switch or two separate horns, but no longer available, unfortunately. What possibly is available in the, is a number of uh, EBAN units um, coming out on the market. This is using Macon chips. Um, looks very good. They work over the 480, 71 to 86, so the transmit receive um, chips co would cover the whole band. Um, they're times eight into the local oscillator and the sort of transmit multiplier. 450 milliwatts out to the chip, that'd be extremely useful at 76 gigs. But <laughs> this thing's got 50, 50, 50 connections, 
I've got no information on voltages or any pin does. Um, this, I think these are almost like my prototype pin. They were done at the beginning of sort of uh, 5G when lots of people thought 5G were going to go up with this band. Um, and there's loads of bits of absorber stuck on top of the transmit and receive chips. So, yeah, but potentially I'd get something out of this. So if I could find the right, the right pin to do the biasing and get a few hundred milliwatts or a couple hundred milliwatts linear out of it, mm. I'll throw the rest of it away. But uh, that's a work in progress. And I discussed this last night, the, uh, these um, Philtronic Orpheus uh, E-band units have come by, or another one of the Polish sellers have been selling them the last few weeks. There are some other Filtronic ones that are still on the web, still only got on his website yesterday. Um, they may be a challenge to use, but there is at least information on these. Uh, they're current on the uh, Filtronic website. Um, not quite as much power as the Macon, about 150 milliwatts, but would be extremely useful. If somebody can work out how to drive the, uh, the synthesizer, um, I think it's 31.31 to 31 a quarter meg steps, but uh, we could always use a, an odd IF, but uh, that's a work in progress. And I gather there is discussion on people have looked at it, so I'm still hopeful. If somebody can work out how to drive a synth, I can give a module and I can take it away and play with it. So, yeah, time is marching. Um, go on to 122. Various ways to uh, to do that. Obviously, the what's transformed everything is the the boards from Australia. I'm going to leave now to uh, to talk about those. Um, the other ways has been more conventional to start with. The multiplier, same sort of multiplier was used on uh, on uh, for, on on uh, 76. Um, Better system probably use a fundamental mixer. Um, more likely that, uh, sorry, it, 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 yeah, it's more, fundamental mixer is the best way to go, but a subharmonic mixer will work really well if you can get power up to 61 gigs to drive it. So, yeah, the VK boards have totally revolutionised operation. There's, I think there's been about 100 imported into the UK in total. And they still remain the best receive option. My my system, which I'll talk about in a sec, it, it, it may be at best on a par with the VK, so that's the best way to go. There is possibly um, adding higher power would uh, give you a greater range, but uh, I'll talk about that. Um, but really, the VK has allowed great experimentation with uh, all different sorts of antennas, and lots of development has been done. We've moved on. And there is a new uh, one coming out, which uh, you may know about, which is uh, we'll do both 122 and 134, which I'll talk about a bit later. So this is my system. Um, again, this has evolved over time. Um, I've got a waveguide switch. This is a WR10 waveguide switch. And that means I can it's, it's good to start from the beginning. So, so we've, I've got a ZL14G synthesizer, which I double. It, but it starts with a nice low phase noise. And as you go in frequency, high in frequency, you realise that low phase noise is essential for the receive side. So it's a super nice Wenzel low noise oscillator. Um, added phase mod. Again, my CW is rubbish. If I can modulate it, FM modulate it, much better way of going. Or, or, or now, of course, we can use uh, Opera, which is, uh, uh, again, no we'll talk about. So, yeah, you know, it won't go high enough, so I double it to 15.3 or 16.8, and that goes into uh, a nice, this is expensive bit, a variable gain times four multiplier, and that will give up to uh, a quarter of a watt out. I'm not using that much power. And something else I found on eBay, a guy was selling a load of millimetre bits. Um, of course, it was the middle of the night for us. I, I put a few bits on things. I didn't get anything except this, and I didn't know what frequency range it was. 
but it's it, 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 it's, a, it's a tunable doubler, and that will give me uh, five milliwatts, five or six milliwatts out. So it, it can go straight into, or, or go via the waveguide switch, it's my little loop here, into the mixer. It's a WR10 um, mixer, so intended to operate up to 110, but uh, works absolutely fine, um, the 120, 134. And, it, and it's a bias mixer, again, found on eBay from Germany. Um, works extremely well. And I can switch the waveguide switch the other way, change frequency of course, we'll switch down here and so I've got then 5 milliwatts out on either uh, 134 or and 122 one at a time of course but I have to retune my multiplier when I swap bands so uh, there's a meter here which monitors the current which uh, I can I can do most and it's a little bit like driving a, an old H, uh, HFPA I have to sort of drive, go for maximum and then find a dip but, uh, Is it my comment to drive? It's micrometer drive. There's actually three micrometers. One of them really doesn't do anything. One's on the input, one's on the output, and you have to you have to pick the uh, the input one and just get the edge of the dip on the uh, the output one. That's sort of a, a sort of close up to it. You can see the micrometer there. I'll try and remember what the settings are, but don't you forget. You just twiddle it and look at the meter. That, that's the output of the, uh, the times for multiplier. I'll go through a, uh, an isolator. I really do not want to damage that. <laughs> uh, another way of doing it, this is a, just a receiver only. This is uh, a receiver that work on 122 and 134. Um, again, starting with the uh, uh, ZL14G synth, which I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, again, these mixers supposedly work, work up to 110. I decided to, if I hit it with 110 as a local oscillator, I could use 24 gigs as EIF. Um, and obviously, for 122, I use, um, what it works out, 98 or whatever. So it's 98 or 110 as yellow. And this is a times six uh, multiplier. Um, I think that's about. Plus, it'll give about plus 14, 15 dBm out. I'll drop it back a bit and again go through a, an isolator to look after it. And, that, and that's a bias for the, uh, the mixer. It's already fixed. But it, it actually means that that mixer will operate down to about a milliwatt drive, which is uh, quite amazing as we can see because of the bias. Um, th this is the more sensitive um, 122, well, more sensitive 134 we see anyway. I haven't really done too much on 122. Uh, and, and this is the, uh, the LO, so it's the ZL14G uh, synthesizer. Uh, one of the wines or um, 100 meg reference in there. And that needs a negative bias, so there's a little coin cell under there, a little relay, so it just switches it when I uh, turn it on. I, I, I was very worried, worried if I tried to make a, a, a negative rail, there would be low enough noise, so I decided that. A coin cell was the best way of doing it. And that comes out at about four and a half gigs, and then times four multiplier up to uh, enough to drive the uh, multiplier, the uh, yeah, the times six multiplier. One, three, four. Um, I talked about my way of doing it. Um, again, the uh, Kuna boards are available, were available, but. Uh, um, we're going to have to look at other ways of doing it because the actual PCBs aren't there. But the, the, the housings and diodes are still available from uh, Philippe DL, DL2AM. Um, and my approach, I've just talked about, is using, using the fundamental mixer. But times four, which is almost a subharmonic mixer, it has some of the advantages of getting rid of uh, the, uh, the odd products, um, works quite well. And the the, the uh, broader modules were able to drive that. So, um, yes, obviously the new VK system is going to be a, possibly the next game changer. Um, it's not cheap, but anything on millimetre isn't cheap. Um, and now, and what, what, an actual, what will happen is that um, 134 has a much less loss than the 122. Um, 
we talk about the operating, we're certainly on the, the part, longer path we did, is at least sort of 10 dB better. So that gives you the chance of doing your 134 and alignment and then going to 122 where the signal might be pretty weak. And it is possible with the PA or doing a double and things to get up to around 5 milliwatts. So, I'm not gonna say much, you can read this. This is what the new dual band V cable does for you over the, the 122. It, well, you, you, I'll let you read it, but it, the, the fact that it's better phase noise, which is gonna be a big advantage. They've actually put the, uh, the IQ quadrature combiner, which uh, was, was one of the improvements of the 122 on the board. Have used a, a better reference. Uh, hopefully, they've really sorted the, uh, the GPS disciplining because that was a, a bit of an issue. Um, so that's it in development. So that is it's the board. It's the same footprint as existing one two two one, um, and we we'll use the same uh, antenna couplers as the, the one two two. That's the circuit, just note that down. <laughs> this is the, uh, the dual band um, silicon radar chip, two antennas on the actual chip, because all, all the high frequency is in the chip, that's, that's why this works. Um, I've used a, a different synth, which is well, use another analog device's synth, which is uh, lower noise. Um, that's just the pick doing all the controlling. Yeah, shouldn't underestimate. This is the, um, the, the sort of team, uh, the information from Andrew, VK3 CV. Hopefully, I got that right. Um, but there's a whole team of them doing this development, and it, we shouldn't underestimate the mental effort work they, they put into this. Uh, I'm not going to lay but stay here because I think probably Noel will have a similar sl slide but this is sort of the losses through the band. Uh, one, th this one's a sort of uh, 60 gigs but this, this one at 122 is a huge oxygen loss. Um, that's why 134, assuming these lines are with the sort of relative humidity, I don't know why, why you have zero, we can never ever get anywhere near there. We're more likely up here with a 50%. But it does work out that 134, uh, not 134, 134 has that, doesn't have that oxygen loss which peaks about 119. So that's why 134 on a low humidity day works uh, better than 122. 241, I think I'm running out of time, but um, again, the boards are available. <coughs> that's briefly is what 122 looks like a one millimeter hole. So your waveguide is um, <laughs> getting very, very silly and small. But you need you need the waveguide um, cutoff, which I'll go back on. Um, I'm going on operating frequencies because the, the sort of 4776 are sort of uh, fairly obvious. Um, why we've got to 122 and the frequencies of 122, uh, in, in some ways probably I'm... Uh, it probably came from some, some of my, come from me to the, the begin with and sort of over discussion on I mean, what was available. And it basically was from the Alcon modules we were using. The, the 122 would be sort of 13.6 times 9 uh, and 134, uh, 11.2 times 9. So that, that sort of, <laughs> and, and a lot of us have got equipment working on 122.4 and obviously with a VK it can go anywhere um, but that's uh, why we've got the frequencies we've got and on 241 it was the absolute limit to one of the Alcom synthesizers I think it was 13.39 which is outside its spec would just get there <laughs> and, and then it's um, we've got times 18 to go up to 24102 uh, and, and the frequency on above 275 was shows it Lost 
Are you done, Roger? Uh, yeah. Nearly. I've, yeah, you want to turn on the Yeah, I've done 37 minutes. Scott Fatt. Oh, the, uh, oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Not my last bit, I'll just speak about which test. Okay. The, the, the last bit, I will end it here, is I'll point out the importance of the waveguide cutoff. Obviously, we can't drill rectangular holes, so the, the round ones are much easier. It, it gives you the, the sort of formula there, and, and that's what we have to use to make sure that uh, we're not actually transmitting to each other on our lower frequency to use that cutoff. Particularly things like the 1mm 176 cutoff to prove that uh, the 241 is actually on, the, on, on 241. Okay, I'll, I'll finish it there, so that uh, no one will uh, carry on.